ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೆ ನಮ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪ್ರಸ್ಥಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಿತಿ ನಾಮನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರವಾನಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶಂಕವಾದಿ ಪಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯೇಷತಾರಿಣೆ ಪಂಚಕೌಪಾತೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗಧಾಧಾ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸರಿ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಸೊ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿಶುಪನಿಷದ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಶುಪನಿಷದ್ ಅಟ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಿ before we begin mantra 8 let us first recite the uh, invocation mantra and mantra 1 which are the two memorization verses om purnam madapurnam idam purnam adam purnam idam purnat purnam udachate purnam udachate ಪೂರ್ಣಶ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯ ಇನ್ವೋಕೇಶನ್ sorry mari yeah do you know the meaning of the invocation mantra uh yes maharaj um, the, the invocation mantra meaning that lord is complete uh-huh. is perfect ha uh, like how many expansions comes from him still he is complete okay what's the word for complete how is it described in the sanskrit purnam purnam okay everything animate and inanimate right yes that's it. that's it that's it mantra 1 not going on to mantra 1 we will ask raja prabhu you know the meaning of the first mantra mr rajan is it mr tribanga prabhu tribanga tribanga is it yes prabhu yes used karmic name hari krishna hari krishna pranam tribanga Dana Bhattana. Yes, Maharaj. Can you tell us the meaning of that first mantra? First mantra, the Bhagavan is complete and he is whole and everything emanates from him and after annihilation, everything will be settled within him. That's the invocation. We want the first mantra. Mantra one. One minute, Maharaj. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Each the Abashyam, Idam Sarvam. Yeah, everything controlled by Lord Krishna. We are uh, we are also controlled completely. Everything controlled by Lord Krishna. He is the supreme controller. Okay. Therefore, what's the second half of the verse? Therefore, uh, uh, we should not, uh, you know, have attachment or feel ownership of controlling anything. Everything belongs to the Bhagavan. Right. Don't take more than your quota. Okay, right? Maharaj. Focus yes, Maharaj. The quota. Don't take more than the quota. So, Ishavasya means what? The Ishavasya society means what kind of society? Keeping Lord Krishna in the center. Keeping Lord Krishna in the center, right. Okay. We want to Lord Krishna in the center. So the, we spoke about the Lord as the proprietor in the first three verses. Then mantra four and mantra five went on to describe more about the Lord and about his different qualities. Yes, Maharaj. We spoke how the Lord is both personal and impersonal. Yes, my no, no, I, Nobody else has put their... I don't see anybody else here. Oh, have we got some more people to ask? Balaram Prabhu, you can tell us. What, what are some of the Lord... In what, what way does the Lord show his impersonal activity? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhrindat Prana Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, here uh, the invocation, uh, sorry, Shokat. Uh, four says, uh, Krishna, uh, sorry, Ma, Bhagwan is nearer as well as far. And he is approachable and, and he is moving also, non-moving also. Yes. And he is fixed, even though he is, although he is fixed in his abode, he is personally present in swifter than the mind and he reaches running when the devotees calls him. Okay. So is that personal or impersonal? Personal form, Maharaj. And what about some impersonal activities? Because we said the Lord is both personal and impersonal. So in what way does he display his impersonal features? Paramatma Rupa. No, Paramatma. So what does the Paramatma do? Paramatma is... Please go ahead. Yes, go. Paramatma is situated in the heart of the person, uh, each living entity, Maharaj. Yeah. And he sees, overlooks all the activities performed by the uh, the living entity, and he gives the. I mean, uh, he is uh, as an uh, is the overseer for the Atma, whatever the activity is done by the Atma. So is that personal or impersonal? I would say that's more personal. I want to hear something. I want to hear some description of his impersonal nature. How is this person impersonally? Krishna Mara. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, he did the Brahman, the absolute truth, in which he sustains the both material and the immaterial. Please, please. How does he do it? Through his uh, energy. Through his energy, right. His energy. The energy of the Lord is impersonal, like his impersonal feature. It's, there's an impersonal aspect of the energy, right? So, what are some features of the 
energy of the Lord, which displays in person. Uh, energy three categories, internal potencies, uh, in which he uh, manifests the spiritual world, and external potencies in which he uh, manifests the material world, and the tatastha, this is marginal potency in which he creates the divatmas. I, well, that's, that's creation. You're talking about creation. Hmm. I, I don't, it's not exactly what I want. I'm thinking more, we talk, when, we, when I brought this up the last time, the lady re replied, she said, just like the light of the sun. The light of the sun is like the light of the sun, yes. feature of light the, of the sun. Right? Yes. The, the taste in water. Another example of the impersonal nature of the Lord. Krishna says, I am the taste in water. I am the light of the sun and the moon. Right? That kind of, this kind of omnipotent energy which is there. This is the impersonal nature of the Lord. And then fire the, in the stomach. Huh? Fire in fire. the stomach. Okay. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. There are many examples there. Of, this is describing the Lord's impersonal energy. And then the, his personal activities, how he relates to devotees, for example. What are some examples? How does he respond with devotees? Uh -huh. Displaying the personal nature, his personal nature. That is uh, the rasa, the five rasas in which he exchanges the loving relationship with the devotees. Yeah, that's that's there. Yeah, and in, in the Bhagavad Gita also, Krishna says, "If somebody surrenders to me, I will free them from all sinful reactions. I will protect them." And he says, "My devotee will never perish." So he, he describes how he has this, a, a personal affection for his devotees. And for those who are not devotees, he puts them, you know, those who are very much against the Lord and who are very demoniac, then he puts them into the lower species of life. You know, this, this is his personal nature, how he deals with these different categories of people, those who are devotees, those who are not devotees. All right, so this was all described, how the, the Lord uh, has inconceivable potencies, right? You can give it, someone can give an example of the inconceivable nature of the Lord, which we studied from the Ishopanishad. Can you give the, the verse? Describing the inconceivable potence, inconceivable energy of the Lord. Oh. Is swifter, swifter than the mind. Mm -hmm. Swifter than the mind, and he walks uh, fa uh, fast, far away. Yeah, but there's another verse which is better describing the inconceivable nature of the almost contradictory. Right? Contradiction comes up, is given. Right. Lord walk and does not walk. Right. This is his contradictory nature. That all called contradictions are there can be there in Krishna. And it's resolved understanding his inconceivable nature. That he has this inconceivable potency. So although there, there, are, there appear to be contradictions, it can all be understood by appreciating his inconceivable potency. That he walks, but he does not walk. He's far away, but he's very near. He's within everything, but he's outside of everything. So this was the inconceivable nature of the Lord. And then we went on to speak about the devotees. Uh, text 6 and 7, we're speaking about devotees, and we were hearing about different categories of devotees, the Kanista devotee, the Madhyama devotee, and the Uttama devotee. 
right? Kanista, the junior devotee or materialistic devotee. So who would like to describe for us about the Kanista devotee? Someone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Kanishta means he is in a lower stage. He goes to temple, uh, um, and uh, but he cannot uh, uh, appreciate the devotees, uh, and he'll be like quarrelling with others sometimes, and is very materialistic. Okay, on how where the, so what is his vision about the Lord? Maharaj, sorry. Maharaj. How does he? See, where does he? The Kanista devotee. The, is he able to see the Lord everywhere? Uh, no, Maharaj. He thinks the Lord is there only in the temple as a deity form. Yeah, he only sees the Lord in the deity, right? That's the the. And then when he hears the when the devotees come, he will actually he he may criticize devotees. Yes. Rather than appreciate devotees, he will be critical of the devotees. So that's really not good. If you criticize the devotees, if you criticize the devotees, that becomes a Vaishnava Parat. But he does, he is a devotee. He does have some faith huh. because he, he's devoted to the deity. He just has very limited understanding. He doesn't have much knowledge. So he needs some mercy. Who's going to give him mercy? Devotees and Krishna marriage. Yeah, devotees especially. Krishna, it's not so easy. Krishna, maybe lucky, we don't know. But devotees are more merciful than Krishna. Yes. So the, the devotees, the Madhyam, what about the vision of the Madhyam devotee? Prima, Prima Maya Mataji, Prima Maya Gopi. You can tell us about the Madhyama devotee. Prabhu is also there. Another Mataji is there. It's a daughter. Yeah. Okay. Are you familiar with this? The Madhyama devotee? How, how does he see things? Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj Pranam. Uh, Madhya Madhikari devotees generally avo uh, uh, avoid atheist. Yes, they will avoid the atheist. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Do they just avoid atheists? Or who did they, what, did they speak to anybody? Do they associate with anyone? These devotees generally uh, distinguish uh, in four categories, Maharaj. Supreme Lord, devotees of the Lord, and innocent, uh, who have no knowledge of Lord, and the atheist, who have no faith in the Lord. Right. So who do they associate with? Who do they keep company with? Uh, he makes friends with uh, uh, the persons who are engaged in devotional service. Right. He makes friends with the devotees, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and does he preach to anybody? Does he give mercy to anybody? Yeah, he tries to give mercy uh, who are innocent about Lord. Right. He wants to find the innocent people, people yeah. who are willing to hear. Yes, ma'am. They may, they may just say, well, I don't know, and, and they're ready to hear, they're ready to ask. So he will give mercy to these people, right? Yes. And what, and what about, the, does he go to the temple? Yeah, they go to the temple, Maharaj. What does he do in the temple? Does he believe in the deity? Yeah, they... Yeah, they worship deity, they do all other sevas. Right. They have faith in the Lord. They worship yeah, they have the faith. Okay, very good. That's a Madhyama devotee. This is a good position for devotees. Devotees, we all want to come at least to the Madhyama position. Right? It's good for, because that's the preaching 
But if you're going to preach, if we're going to distribute Krishna consciousness, we should be on the Madhyama level. You don't want to be an Uttama Adhikari and be trying to preach. Why not? Because, well, Madhya, the Uttama Adhikari, he sees, how does that, we ask somebody else who didn't speak yet? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Uttama Adhikari. Uh, Uttam Adhikari is like uh, he sees everything uh, means for an atheist and theist he finds out equally so there is no differentiate he finds everyone at an equal position hmm. I think everybody is serving Krishna right everyone has a part and parcel of God means Krishna everyone's a part and parcel of God okay so this and is Uttam Adhikari right Pralat Maharaj was Uttam Adhikari right you remember what happened? His father, Haranyakashipu, asked him, Where is your God? What did Prahlad say? Yeah, everywhere, everywhere, wherever I can see it, so he's a present everywhere. Right, that's right. That's Uttama Adhikari edition. So, Lord Nishingadev appeared like that. So, this is Uttama Adhikari, the topmost devotee. Topmost devotee. He's very strong faith and also very good knowledge also. Madhyama devotee, he has faith, knowledge, maybe not so perfect, not so strong, but his faith is very strong. Kanista devotee, weak faith, weak knowledge. Like that. So we want to come at least to the Madhyama stage and go on and try to develop our knowledge, understand more. Okay, so we heard about the Lord, seeing the Lord everywhere. How to, how to see the Lord? We heard about Ekadvam uh, Anupashyata. Who can tell me the meaning? Ekadvam Anupashyata. We covered this in the last class. Ekadvam Anupashyata. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Ekadvam means oneness with the Lord. And Anupashyata means to observe or follow the previous Acharyas. Okay. So we have oneness with the Lord. Achuta. Is it Achuta Damada? Achuta Giridhar. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Danut Pranam. Danut Pranam, Prabhu. You can tell us about this oneness with the Lord. In what way do we have oneness with the Lord? The oneness in the quality, ekatvam, and anupashyata means he sees, one who sees through authority or one who sees constantly like that. So we have, we have all the qualities of God. Yeah, we have the uh, qualities, uh, but the quantity is different. Like uh, the example is given like the, in the fire, uh, we, we are the spark and the Lord is the like uh, fire. So okay. we have the uh, quality is the same, but we are different in the quantity. Different in quantity, right. So oneness. Oneness also in interest. We spoke about having this, the common interest as the Lord. Just like the father and the children. When the family are all working together, then they will have the same interest as the father. They will work together. So the same way we have Krishna, the Supreme Lord, the Father, of Father of the creation, and we are all his parts and part, his children. We want to have the same interest as the Lord, to serve his interest. All right, so we'll go ahead now on to Mantra 8. You can see the verse, it's shared for us on the screen. Saparyajak chukramakayam avranam. You can repeat Sapariya, 
Such a person must factually know the greatest of all, the personality of Godhead, who is unembodied, omniscient, beyond reproach, without veins, pure and uncontaminated, the self-sufficient philosopher who has been fulfilling everyone's desire since time immemorial. So the, the translation begins, such a person. What person is, is being referred to? What, can, what person, what is being referred to here? Such a person. Who is, who is the Ekatvam? Uttamadikari Maharaj. Yeah, maybe Uttamadikari may also be Madhyam Adikari. Madhyam Adikari also knows about the Lord. Right? Yes, Maharaj. Madhyam Adikari is the preacher. So the Madhyam and the Uttama, they both know about the, the Lord. They understand about the Lord. So he, he must know factually the greatest of all personality of Godhead. All right, so let's hear the purport. Summa Duri Shyam Prabhu. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Summa Duri Shyam. Please read for us, purport. Yes, Maharaj. Here is a description. Here is a description of the transcendental and eternal form of the absolute personality of Godhead. The Supreme Lord is not formless. He has his own transcendental form, which is not at all similar to the forms of mundane world. The form of living entities in this world are embodied in material nature and they work like any material machine. The anatomy of material body must have a mechanical construction with veins and so forth. But the transcendental body of the Supreme Lord has nothing like veins. It is clearly stated here that he is un unembodied, unembodied, embodied which means that there is no difference between his body and his soul, nor is he forced to accept a body according to the laws of nature. As we are in materially conditioned life, the soul is different from the gross embodiment and subtle mind. For the Supreme Lord, however, there is a never any such difference between him and his body and mind. He is the complete whole and his mind, body, and he himself are all one and the same. Harikash. All right, thank you, Mataji. So we're hearing about these different descriptions of the Lord. Because the, 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 the verse began, such a person must know, in fact, the greatest of all who is unembodied. Unembodied means he doesn't have a body. So, does the Lord have a body or does he not have a body? Yes, he has a body. His but, body, uh, his body he, is made up of Satchidananda. Right, because his body is Satchidananda, right? It's not made of what? What about Gross, our bodies? How, how are our bodies? What are our bodies? Our, our body is, is made up of material elements. elements. Yes, what kind of elements are in our body? Uh, five things are there. Earth, water, fire, ether, and air. Okay. So and three subtle mind, a false ego, and intelligence. All right. So this earth, water, fire, air, ether, they combine together in different ways 
to produce things like bones and veins and blood, right? Yes, Maharaj. And within the body, you, you know, it's not very nice, right? When, when they do surgery and they open the body, they, you know, ooh, <laughs> very, very horrible things, you know, very disgusting even sometimes. So this, but we're so attracted to the body and we're so devoted to the body. We spend so much time and put so much energy and care to make the body look nice to keep it beautiful and to keep it healthy and attractive. We do so many things, but this body is just made up of all these disgusting elements. But somehow they're put together in the form of a machine, right? Prabhupada talks about the machine. In fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says like that. Just, they work like, Prabhupada said, they work like any material machine. Machine, right? The living entity sits on the body, machine of material nature. So machine needs a, when you have a machine, what else do you need to go with the machine? One operator. Yes, you need to have the operator, right? Who is the operator on the machine of the body? Soul and super soul? Yeah, the living entity, right? The living entity is there. So we sit on this body, we're directing, making decisions. So, so the same way, uh, so living entities, we have the material body, but here we're, we're talking about the Lord, that the transcendental body of the Lord, there are no veins. He's unembodied. There's a difference between the body and the soul. So, because the Lord doesn't take, we take the body according to our karma from the past. But the Lord, he doesn't have karma. He's the director of karma. He's in charge of everything. He's above, above the law. <laughs> We're under the law of the material nature. Law of material nature. Could you describe the law of material nature to me? How does it work? Uh, law of material nature is three gunas. Sattva, Raja, and Tamagunas. Three more how, how, the, how does it work? What's the basic law of material nature? The basic principle. We will say, in, in Hindi, they would say, Jaisa Karega, Aisa Barega. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. <laughs> That's the basic law of material nature. And that principle is there in every culture all over the planet. In the Christian world, it's in the Bible, it says, as you sow, so shall you reap. As you sow, like the farmer in the field, he's sowing seeds. If he sows seeds for melons, he will harvest melons. If he sows seeds for beans, he will harvest beans. Hmm? Isn't it? And in, in China also, they have the saying that if you do good, you will get good. And if you do bad, you will get bad. Shan yo shan bao, o yo o bao. Chinese, right? So this, this law, under this is the laws of nature. But for Krishna or the Supreme Lord, he's above the law. To give an example, maybe when you were young, when you were children, Maybe your father would say to you, don't go, don't go out late at night. You come home early. I don't want you being out late at night. So you may say, but father, you, you go out late at night. You don't come home early. You often go out late. Why can't I go out late at night? 
and father will say, because it's my home, I can do what I like. I'm above the law, right? So the same way Krishna or the Supreme Lord works like that. He's above the law. He's not under the law. He's the, the lawmaker. So uh, he's not forced to take a body according to the material nature. And his body, the body which he takes, is of a different nature to our body. Because what's the difference? What, you said his body was Satchit Ananda, right? Eternity, bliss, and knowledge. Yes, Maharaj. So, there's no difference between his, 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 his pen. Body, his, soul, and mind. Yeah, there's no difference. His body, between him and his body and his mind, he's a complete whole. Mind, body, himself are all one and the same. Uh, when Srila Prabhupada began preaching Krishna consciousness in the 19, 1966, it was in New York. So Prabhupada didn't have his own Bhagavad Gita. So he had to use someone else's Bhagavad Gita. And in that other person's Bhagavad Gita, he had given a commentary. Well, there was a verse where Krishna says, Surrender, give up all religion and surrender unto me. So Prabhupada was explaining how we have to surrender to Krishna. But the person who had written the book, which Prabhupada was using, he was an impersonalist. And he gave in his purport about the verse, he said, it is not to Krishna that we have to surrender, but to the unborn unmanifested within Krishna, <laughs> you know? So this is Mayavadi philosophy. When you speak about the unborn, the unmanifested within Krishna, like there's something different between Krishna and the unborn, the unmanifested within Krishna. And so the impersonalists say they do not understand the nature of Lord Krishna that Krishna has a transcendental body and they're thinking there's something different in the body of Krishna. But Prabhupada said, no, that the body, the mind, the soul is all of the same spiritual nature. There's no difference between his body and his soul. Right? So this is the meaning to the Lord having a spiritual body or being unembodied. As you said, not, it's not a body like our body. Okay, we'll go ahead to the next section. Uh, some Prabhu can read for us. Want some man like to read, please? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, in the Brahma Samhita 5.1, there is similar description of the Supreme Lord. He is described there as Satchit Ananda Vigraha, which means that he is eternal form, fully representing the transcendental existence, knowledge and bliss. As such, he does not require a separate body or a mind as we do in the material existence. The Vedic literature clearly states that the Lord's transcendental body is completely different from ours. Thus, he sometimes described as formless. This means that he has no forms like ours and that he, he is devoid of a form can conceive of. In Brahma Samhita, in Brahma Samhita 5.32, it is for... It is for the it is further stated uh, that with each and every part of the body, he can do the work of other senses. This means that the Lord can walk with his hands, accept things, uh, accept with, with his legs, see with his hands and feet, eat with his eyes, etc. In, 
in the Smriti mantra, Shruti mantras, it is also said that although the Lord has no hands and legs like ours, he has different types of hands and legs by which he can accept all that we offer him and run faster than anyone. These points are confirmed in the eighth mantra through the use of word like Sukram, omnipotent, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Omnipotent, right. So the Lord is omnipotent. And of course, we sing about this every morning when we sing the Brahma Samhita prayers greeting the deities. Yeah. Angani yasya shakalandriya vritti manti pashyanti panti kalayanti chiram chaganti ananda chinmaya sadutvala vigrahasya govindam adipursam. Right? We're singing like this. How I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, uh, who any one of his senses can perform the actions of any of the other senses. We cannot do that, right? We can only smell with the nose. We cannot taste with the eyes. We are not omnipotent, but the Lord, he can do these things. And how do we apply this in, in our dealing with the deity? How do we, when we make offerings to the Lord, how do we offer to the Lord? How does the Lord accept our offerings? Right? Do you offer your food? Prabhu? Yes? Yes, my Lord. You offer your food? You have a deity at home? Y yes, my Lord. I have a Damudra, a Laddu Gopal at our house. Okay. And, so uh, when, when you offer your food, how does the Lord accept the offerings? He's uh, happy. How, how, no, how does he actually accept the offerings? How does he accept them? I'm, what does he by, use? By seeing, by, by, by live, means by bhakti, uh, means I'm saying the prema, the way I'm serving him. Okay. And how do you, how are you serving him? What are you doing to, to invite him to come to eat? Uh, we have this uh, Boga Mantra Maharaj, uh, and we pray to him to come uh, three times. And, of, uh, uh, and we uh, inform him whatever I'm serving to him. And uh, in that, uh, there are four types of, uh, usually we serve. Uh, so, the, so the Lord can hear, right? Yes, yes. He hears. He hears the mantras. And he understands. Yes. So by the, through our chanting of the mantra, the Lord hears. And then he also sees with his eyes, he sees the offerings. So in this way, he's eating through the mantra which you chant and also through the presentation of the food placed before him. So the Lord accepts both with his ears and with his eyes. He accepts the food offered to him. And in this way, we are allowed to later on, after he's, had, after he's enjoyed the offering, we take his remnants, his prasada. Yes, my Lord. Right? Sometimes he is happy also. After seeing the different prasad, he becomes happy also. We hope so. Yes. Well, the Lord is, of course, he, he is always happy. He's Ananda Maya Bayasa. His nature is to be in transcendental bliss. But certainly, if we make a nice offering, then it will be pleasing to him. We want to please, try to please the Lord. We are, you know, we're not very powerful that we can actually satisfy the Lord. <laughs> he has so many goddesses of fortune all serving him there in the spiritual world. So what do we have to offer him? Of course, as you said, the important thing is our bhakti. So if we show that real genuine devotion and invite him to accept the offering by our devotion, then that's very good. The Lord is conquered by our pure loving devotion. All right, so He's the wonderful. Lord has a form 
is not formless. And uh, we are understanding the nature of his transcendental potency, how his senses are omnipotent. Any one sense can perform the activity of the other senses. So this is very amazing that we cannot compare. We have no experience like this in the material world. But this is a transcendental realm. The Lord has these powers. Go ahead. Next verse. Another Prabhu can read. Hare Krishna Maharaj. The, the Lord's worshipable form, Archaka Vikraha, which is installed in temples by authorized Acharyas, who have realized the Lord in terms of Mandra Seven, is not different from the original form of the Lord. The Lord's original form is that of Sri Krishna, and Sri Krishna expands himself into the unlimited number of forms such as Baladeva, Rama, Narsimha, and uh, Varaha. All of these forms are one and the same personality of Godhead. Similarly, the Archavgraha worshipped in temples is also an explained form of the Lord. By worshipping the Archavgraha, one can at once approach the Lord, who accepts the service of a devotee by his omnipotent energy. The Archavigraha, the Archavigraha of the Lord descends at the request of the Acharyas, the holy teachers, and work exactly in the original way of the Lord by virtue of the Lord's omnipotence. Foolish people who have no knowledge of Sri Yusubhanesha or any of the other Shruti mantras consider the Archavigraha, which is worshipped by fever devotees, to be made up of material elements. This form may be seen as material by the imperfect eyes of foolish people or Kanishka Diaries. But such people do not know that the Lord, being omnipotent or omniscient, can transform matter into spirit and the spirit into matter as he desires. Okay, so what are the Shruti mantras? What is Prabhupada talking about the Shruti mantras? The Upanishad mantras and also Vedic mantras. Okay, yes, right, the Vedic mantra. So the, the, Lord, the Lord's worshipable form installed in the temple by all, has been realized in terms of Mantra 7. What was that realization in terms of Mantra 7? Do you remember the pre, ma, previous verse, previous yeah. mantra? Yeah, the, the previous 7th, seven, seven, this one we were talking about uh, uh, the uh, energy of the Lord everywhere, and uh, he's, uh, not, he's not impersonal, he's very much personal. Uh, he, he, uh, the qualitatively, all the devotees and uh, Lord are one and the same. Uh, okay, so that's right, that's what was mentioned. One, uh, one who sees all living entities in quality, one with the Lord, right? So yeah. that is the idea, to understand the living entities also being in relationship to the Lord, one in quality, different in quantity. Okay. So the Lord's deity is installed by the Acharyas. They've understood this, that the Lord is present. He has his original form and the living entities are his tiny parts and parcels. The original form of Sri Krishna, Sri Krishna expands himself unlimited form. So we hear about the different forms of the Lord, right? Balaram, Nishrima, Varaha, so many forms, so many incarnations of the Lord. The original form is Krishna. He's Ete Chamsa Kalapumsa Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. Krishna is the Swayam Bhagavan. He's the original, or just like Candles, one candle can light so many other candles. Okay? And Brahma Samhita, that's also mentioned about how the light of one candle can be the same in so many other candles, but still there's one original candle. And that one original candle is Krishna. And Lord Krishna expands in so many forms, but they're, they're all one and the same. In the same way, the deity is another form of the Lord. When we install the deity, it's not different from the Lord, that the Lord appears there. 
So the Lord, it's one of the Lord's incarnations, Archa Vigraha. So it's put into the, the we instab, we put the deity in the temple and we worship the deity. We can this way we can offer our service to Krishna, and the Lord can accept our service. So Prabhupada talks about how the deity comes to this world at the request of the acharyas, right? When we install the deity, generally we'll do the, the stand, what is it called? Pratishta, the, the pran pratishta to bring the life into the deity. And that's done at the but you have the pure devotee, the acharya come and he will chant the mantras and invite the Lord to appear in the deity. So at the request of the pure devotee, the, the Lord appears there in the deity. Of course, we can also invite the Lord by power, the power of mantras, the power of the holy name. In that way, the Lord also appears. So Prabhupada said, uh, the Lord works exactly in the original way of the Lord by virtue of the Lord's omnipotency. The deity, not different from the Lord. But people who have no knowledge of the Ishupanishad or the Vedas, they think the deity to be made of material elements. They're thinking the deity is just stone, or oh, it's just wood, or oh, it's just some grass, it's not just a statue. They don't see the transcendental form. They don't see the life in the deity. They don't have transcendental vision. So this is the foolish people. They see it as material. You know, sometimes you can use the adhikaris, they may be like that also. Generally they are. They don't know that the Lord can appear in the material elements. Generally, you go to some these temples, like some some kind of Hindu temple, and they, they don't actually do deity worship, they do murti puja. They think the Lord is just the, they think the deity is just a well they well they don't think it's a deity. They install forms of Lord Krishna or other people, other devas, but they think they're just means to becoming one, to entering into the oneness, into the Brahman. And they think these, they put these statues there, statues of Shiva and Krishna and Rama and everybody. And they think this is a means, this is for our meditation and ultimately we'll all become one. And they think all the gods are the same, you see? So this is, uh, they, they don't do actual deity worship. Actually, deity worship, you don't see the Lord worship very properly, except in Vaishnava temples. The Vaishnavas, they actually worship the deity properly. So, the Lord can appear in the material elements and he can transform the material elements into spiritual energy. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, in the next paragraph, yes, go ahead. In the Bhagavad Gita, 9.11 and 9.12, the Lord regrets the fallen condition of men uh, with a little knowledge who derade him because of his, uh, because he descends like a man into this world. Such poorly informed persons do not know the omnipotence of the Lord. Thus, the Lord does not manifest himself in full to the mental speculators. He can be appreciated only in proportion to one's surrender to him. The fallen condition of the living entities is being entirely to forgetfulness of their relationship with God. Okay. So the fallen condition, fallen condition, and this, this is the most fallen condition. That they think of God to be an ordinary man. So even 5,000 years ago when Lord Krishna appeared, not everybody could understand Lord Krishna was God. Only certain devotees could understand. There were many other persons they could not understand at all. And so people think, oh, God should come 
if God was to come today, then we would recognize him that he's God. But 5,000 years ago when he came, there were people, they didn't recognize him. Just like uh, Lord Krishna met Kamsa's laundry man, Lord Krishna and Balaram had come from Mathura and they met with Kamsa's laundry man and they come from Vrindavan and they saw Kamsa's laundry man had so many nice cloth. So they asked him, can you give some for us? Well, he got angry, he didn't want to give them. So th this is the nature of the demon. They don't want to serve Krishna, even though the, he was so fortunate he could meet Krishna. He didn't want to give service to Krishna. But when Lord Krishna met Kubja, Kubja was also working for Kamsa. But when she met Lord Krishna, she was happy to offer everything to Krishna, to give her sandalwood paste, which she grinded. And when Krishna met Sudama, the florist, Sudama also offered to Krishna nice flower garlands. So there were devotees. So it depends on the condition of the living entity. There are some people who surrender and there are some who don't. We'll go ahead. Who's there to read? Pramdak Pranam Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. In this mantra, as well as in many other Vedic mantras, it is clearly stated that the Lord has been supplying goods to the living entities from time immemorial. A living being desires something and the Lord supplies the object of that desire in proportion to one's qualification. If a man wants to be a high court judge, he must acquire not only the necessary qualifications, but also the con consent of the authority who can award the title of high court judge. The qualifications in themselves are insufficient for one to occupy the post. It must be awarded by some superior authority. Similarly, the Lord awards enjoyment to living entities in proportion to their qualifications. But good qualifications in themselves are not sufficient to enable one to receive awards. The mercy of Lord is also required. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay, so to <laughs> so an important this is an important point. Just like one may be a very good Brahman, he may have all the Brahminical qualities, but he cannot become a spiritual master unless he is also a devotee. He must also be a devotee. Then he can actually become a spiritual master. But one may be very expert, know all the scriptures and everything, but he may not have devotion. So here also Prabhupada's giving the point, high court judge, so many lawyers may be qualified, but you have to have the authority. The authority has to get that this man should become the high court judge. So mercy. The mercy of the Lord is required. Just like we're coming up to Damodar month and we remember the pastime of binding Lord Damodar, Mother Yashoda binding, adding the ropes. But they were always two fingers short, right? And the two fingers short, one finger represents the sadhana, doing the sadhana, and the other finger represents the mercy that the Lord has to agree to be bound up. It's not enough just to be the devotee, but you still need the approval of the Lord. The Lord was willing to let Mother Yashoda bind him up. So then Mother Yashoda could tie him up. So the mercy of the Lord, very important. We need the mercy. It's not just only I'm qualified to go back to Godhead, <laughs> you need the Lord's mercy. Does the Lord want us to go back to Godhead? Remember the story of the cobbler and the brahmana. The brahmana thought himself to be very qualified. But Lord Narayan said, no, no, I don't want that brahmana back here yet. Let him stay in the material world. He's so proud. He's so arrogant. Let him stay there. 
But that cobbler, oh, he's my devotee, he's very humble, very pious. Yes, bring, he can come. So the mercy of the Lord, by the mercy, the grace of the Lord. So we are all trying to get that, the mercy of the Lord. That's important. But not only, we don't just want to only depend on the mercy only. We have to deserve the mercy. We have to deserve that mercy and we, the, we qualify for that mercy by our intense endeavor and our eagerness to serve the Lord and to surrender to him. So very important point, right? We'll go ahead. Any, any questions so far? No? Okay, we'll go ahead. Let's have uh, is, is Sasinath Chaitanya Prabhu there. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Saswat Chaitanya. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Ah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Prabhu, please. Yeah. Ordinarily, the living beings does not know what to ask from the Lord, nor which post to seek. When the living being comes to know his constitutional position, however, he asks to accept it into the transcendental association of the Lord in order to render transcendental loving service unto him. Unfortunately, living beings under the influence of material nature ask for many other things. And they are described in the Bhagavad Gita 2.41 as having divided or split intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is one, but mundane intelligence is diverse. In Srimad Bhagavatam 7.5.30.31, it is stated that those who are captivated by the temporary beauties of the eternal energy forget the real aim of life which is to go back to Godhead. Forgetting this, one tries to adjust things by various plans and programs. But this is like achieving what, uh, what has already been achieved. Nothing less, the Lord is so kind that he allows the forget living entity to continue in, in this way without interference. Thus, the mantra of Sri Ishopanishad uses the very appropriate word indicating that the Lord rewards the living entities just in pursuance of their desires. If a living being wants to go to hell, the Lord allows him to do so without interference. And if he wants to go back home, back to Godhead, the Lord helps him. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, in the, in the mantra, in the mantra 8, it was mentioned, who, the, that the Lord is awarding everyone's desires since time immemorial. Immemorial. Right? So since yes. time immemorial, from the beginning of time, the Lord is awarding everyone's desire. So Prabhupada talks that we have to know what to desire, what to ask from the Lord. What should you ask for? There was one man in America, when Prabhupada was there in New York, there was one man came to him. The man was a, uh, he, he was quite a well-known man. He, he, he was a, a Christian evangelist and he used to play the guitar and sing songs about God and everything, you know, religious songs about God. And he came to meet Prabhupada and he asked Prabhupada, he, and he, 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 he asked Prabhupada, please tell me, he said, what to pray for? He said, I know that praying is very important for all of us. We all have to pray. But he said, I'm, I don't know what, what we should pray for. And, you know, the man had been preaching all of his life about God and about prayer, but he didn't really know what to pray for. <laughs> so to Prabhupada, of course, it was very clear, easy to tell him what we should be praying for. Right? What do you pray for, Prabhu? We have to pray for the Krishna Prema, you have to serve the Krishna. Okay, yeah. We want to get love of God, right? Yeah. Lord Chaitanya says, 
Nadanam, Nadanam, right? He doesn't want wealth, he doesn't want followers, he doesn't want beautiful women, he does he just he doesn't even want liberation. He just simply wants devotional service, birth after birth. Right? Birth after devotional yes. service. So that is the pure desire. That's the higher, the, the highest desire. We want like that. Loving service unto the Lord. So if we can get that service to the Lord. But people are bewildered. They're so busy. They go to temple, they go to church, go to mosque, and they're all praying, give me, give me, give me. So they're offering so many prayers, but their prayers are all in the business. We're asking the Lord. We think the Lord is like some shopkeeper. And you go to him and ask. Or you go to him to beg. Oh, give me. Oh, oh my Lord, please give me. I will worship you. Just give me. We go to ask so many things. Of course, when we're in difficulties, then it's natural that we'll go to God and ask for his help. This is this is pious, but we have to go on from there. Not that we just simply come to God only when we're in difficulty. When we're in difficulties, we think of God, and when there's no difficulty, we think of our money, and we think how to enjoy. So that is not the real purpose of devotional service. We have to understand the nature of the Lord. Of course, Krishna does not force us. He gives us that free will. He gives us that independence. Whatever we want, as we desire. We want to forget him. He allows us. The super soul in the heart. Mm. He's giving knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. Yeah, according to our desire. We have to know how to develop, to keep that desire, to want to simply serve the Lord, not to forget Him. And we should understand that God that if we simply go to God to ask him for things, then this is condemned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is called Kaitava Dharma or cheating religion. Cheating. Because we go to God and we're saying, we're saying, we're saying to him, I love you, I love you, but we're thinking, where's the money? Where's the money? So this is business. This is not real religion. We want to understand what is real religion, the real purpose of religion. This is of a higher nature. So we don't have to purify our heart from these things, of course. And the people who come to God with material desires, it's it's good. They came to God. They're pious people. But we have to go on. They have to go on. We have to help them to come to a higher level of understanding how to relate to God. Not that we just come to only get some sense gratification and then go back again and try to enjoy again material life. That is not good. That is but that is going on. That's very common in the name of religion. All the religions, cheating religion. And we want to show people what is pure religion, that, that there are cheating religion, but there is also real religion. And that is to develop love for the Lord, as you have said. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes. Next, next paragraph. God is described here, here, here as a Pari, Pari Bahu, the greatest of all. No one is greater than or equal to him. 
other living beings are described here as a beggars who ask goods from the lord the lord supplies the things the living entities desire if if the entities were equal to the lord in potency if they were omnipotent or omniscient there would be no question of their begging from the lord even for so called liberation real liberation means going back to godhead liberation as convinced by uh, convinced of by any impersonalist is a myth and begging for sense gratification has to come uh, continue eternally unless the beggar comes to his spiritual senses and re- realizes his constitutional position all right thank you so prabhupad mentions here is that there would be no question of begging if we were omnipotent and omni- omniscient why wouldn't we have to beg if you don't have anything then only we have to beg right but what so why does prabhupada say if we are omnipotent omnipotent omni, omnipotent and omniscient we don't have to beg yeah this god only having omnipotent with this living entity is not omnipotent yeah now yeah, and if we are equal to god then we don't need to beg anything not from him right yes no so that's right so we are equal to him so we you know you you don't beg from somebody who's your equal you beg if people's got something you don't have so then he talks about liberation so called liberation he said liberation as conceived by an impersonalist is a myth why is that why is it a myth myth means it's not actual liberation it's not real liberation why not what kind of liberation are the impersonalists achieving they want to merge with the lord right they want to merge with the lord right so why is it a myth because this is not the perfect uh, liberation why not because this is a chances of again to come down to the material world why do they come down to the material world because our constitution position is to serve the lord not with the same feature of the lord or merge with the lord how can they do that in the, when they are liberated when they are liberated are they what do they do when they become they, one yeah they they thinking they are become one but it is not uh, the actual so what are they doing when they become one they think they also draw so what do they do there's no activity man no activity yeah, right yeah. no activity there's no activity there's no variety there's no engagement so that is not the sick that is not a nature why not because our nature is to say serve, serve the lord the nature of the soul is activity activities the soul has to have some activity activity right there has to be some activity and there's no activity no engage you know just like if we put you in a room we put you in a room with nothing in the room just a bare room and you lock you in the you know how long will you stay there you're not going to stay you'll get very bored you'll become oh you know you look for people you'll be calling people oh, yeah just like now they do this quarantine they have this system mm-hmm. like quarantine right to get quarantine yes. you have to be and people they have to go in the room for two weeks they stay in the room in the hotel room for two weeks or something to make sure they don't have the disease and you know what do they do they're in the room for two weeks oh you know very terrible you know they're, they're calling all the time and they're watching television all the time and they get so bored they become so much uh, frustrated it's so difficult because not the nature because pers- we are all persons and we we act on the basis of activities and interactions and relationships 
If you don't have these things, very difficult. And so the impersonalist liberation is a myth. It's not actual liberation because there's no real opportunity for them to express their proper nature. And therefore they come back to the material world. So we, we want to come to the proper realization, the, realizing our conditional position, which means servant, to be that the Lord is the master and we are his servant in their different relationships. Okay, go ahead. Only the Supreme Lord is self-sufficient. When Lord Krishna appeared on our 5,000 years ago, he displayed his full manifestation as the personality of Godhead through his various activities. In his childhood, he killed many powerful demons such as Agasura, Bakasura, and Sakatasura. And there was no question of his having such power through any extra extraneous endeavor. He lifted Govardhana hill without ever practicing weight lifting. He danced with the gopis without social restrictions and without approach. Although the gopis approached him with the paramours feelings of love, the relationship between the gopis and Lord Krishna was worshipped even by Lord Chaitanya, who was a strict sannyasi and rigid follower of disciplinary re regulations. To confirm that, the Lord is always pure and uncontaminated. Sri Shopanishad describes him as Shuddham, antiseptic, and Apapa Vidam, Apapa Vidum, propylitic. He is antiseptic in, this, uh, in the sense that even an uh, impure thing things can become purified just by touching him. The word propylitic refers to the power of his association. As mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita 9.30 and 31, a devotee may appear to be a Sudurachara, not well behaved in the beginning, but he should be accepted as pure because he is on the right path. This is due to the propylitic nature of the Lord's association. The Lord is also a papa with them because sin cannot touch him, even if he acts in a way that appears to be sinful. Such actions are all good, for there is no question of his being affected by sin, because in all circumstances, he is shuddham, most purified. He is often compared to the sun. The sun extracts moisture from many untouchable places on the earth, yet it remains pure. In fact, it purifies abnoxious things by virtue of its sterilizing powers. If the sun, which is a material object, is so powerful, then we can hardly begin to imagine the purifying strength of the all-powerful Lord. Hare Krishna Mahadev. All right. So we're hearing about these other qualities of the Lord. Lord. Uh, we heard the Lord is such a person must know, in fact, the greatest of all. Like he's the greatest of all. He's above all others. Uh, this is described, of course, also in Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna said, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me, just like pearls are strung on a thread. So Krishna was establishing himself. He, as, no, you know, no other Deva ever said that. Lord Shiva never says. Ganesh never says. No one ever says, there's no truth superior to me. But Lord Krishna could say this. So he, he's the greatest of all. Without veins, uh, was unembodied, omniscient. Omniscient. He, uh, he knows everything. He knows past, he knows the present, and he knows the future. He knows everything. Why? 
because he's uh, he is the lord of the creation he's the cause of all causes it's all under his direction so he's omniscient without veins he's pure and uncontaminated so we're hearing about the, the, this these particular qualities here there's a purity the shudam antiseptic but uses the word antiseptic just like you may have some disease you may have some infection or something so you put some antiseptic on it right the antiseptic will stop the spread of the disease right it's going to the disease is some there's some infection already there. you put the antiseptic on it and it stops the infection from spreading right and and become cured and then apapa vidam prophylactic something is prophylactic just like malaria prophylactics you take some malaria tablets so that you don't get malaria maybe you're coming to india in the summer and you want to be sure you don't get malaria so you would take some uh, malaria prophylactics they will protect you so this apa vidam that implies that even somebody may do something sinful there's no there's no reaction from it it doesn't affect them this lord krishna may do things which appear to be sinful just like lord krishna dancing the rasalila with the gopis in the middle of the night in the forest with the young girls but it is a pop apapa vidam it's prophylactic there's no sin coming due to it the lord is not affecting there are many examples of krishna doing things which people may criticize him stealing the butter he's known as the makinchor and he's also called ranchor because he leaves the battlefield hmm. so krishna and then krishna is kunja bihari he's enjoying the pastimes in the forest of vrindavan with the gopis but it's not sinful there's no sin for krishna we have to understand his transcendental nature in fact we have to understand how he purifies everything just by coming in contact with it that if we hear about krishna we hear about krishna's activities about krishna stealing the butter and krishna leaving the battlefield and krishna dancing with the gopis the result of all of this is that we can become purified just simply by hearing about it so this is the wonderful effect of lord krishna's potency and at the end prabhupad gives the example about the sun how something may be very contaminated untouched uh, uh, you know people pass so many obnoxious things the waste they may pass stool and urine and so on but the sun comes is is the sun go going to be affected by it no the sun will purify it the sun purifies everything so in the same way if if even the sun which is material can purify something then how much greater the purification of lord krishna is that we come in contact with lord krishna and we hear about lord krishna his activities his pastimes we chant his name we sing songs about his pastimes we worship his form the result is purification it's all shudam apapavidam it's antiseptic and prophylactic ah uh, pure and uncontaminated so lord krishna is also described as the self sufficient philosopher awarding everyone's desires since time immemorial so we did we discussed about lord krishna awarding everyone's desires but the self sufficient philosopher lord krishna is self sufficient he doesn't depend on us 
He doesn't depend on others. He is completely self-sufficient. You know, we talk about becoming self-sufficient. We want to become independent. We like this idea. It sounds attractive. We, we, people often begin some kind of farming project and say, we should be self-sufficient. We'll grow our own foods and so on. We're not going to purchase anything. We'll just produce everything ourselves. So Krishna is the self-sufficient philosopher. He spoke the Bhagavad Gita in the middle of the battlefield. He's, he's also a philosopher. And sometimes he also quotes scriptures. We see in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna speaking, quoting Vedanta Sutra. So Lord Krishna is the, the perfect philosopher. And he performs so many wonderful activities just to give pleasure to his devotees. Killing of the demons mentioned here, Aga, Baka, Shakatasura, right? You know who is Aga? Right? What, what was the form of Aga Sura? How snake he, form. Big snake form. Snake right? form. This one. How did he come to Vrindavan? What happened? He was he sent by Kamsa Maharaj. So huh? he was sent by the demon Kamsa. You're one of the friends of Kamsa? Uh -huh. So he came to Vrindavan and uh, uh, he, he just uh, pretended like a cave. How? He made a cave? Where? He opened his mouth. Yeah, he was so big, right? He opened his mouth. And was a, a nice smell was coming out of his mouth? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Really? Was a pleasant smell coming out of his mouth? No, no, Maharaj. From his mouth. No. Hmm? Not pleasant, right? Yes, Maharaj. Very, very unpleasant smell coming out from his mouth. So then what happened? Then the Gopas uh, one day thought it's a cave and they entered uh, into the mouth of Agasura. Mm -hmm. uh, Krishna went and saved uh, the, all the Gopas, killing the Agasura. Yeah. yeah, Krishna saw Agasura and he thought, my goodness, how amazing this material energy is that this demon could assume such an a, a, such a nasty, ignorant form as this huge, big snake. And so, on the coward boys, they were thinking, well, if we go in, we know Krishna is going to save us. If anything's wrong, if there's any danger there, Krishna will protect us. So, the coward boys went in, and Krishna was thinking how powerful the illusory energy is that these cowherd boys are going in there. So Krishna also had to go in, and then when Krishna went in, then Agasura closed his mouth. Yes. So now I've caught them. So what happened? Then Krishna tore the, uh, the body of the Agasura. Krishna what? Like he tore the body of the Agasura, two pieces. Expanded himself. Expanded himself. Uh, expanded. Yeah, he expanded. In the mouth of the demon, Krishna expanded himself. So the demon choked. Uh. And then the demon gave up his body, gave up his life. And the coward boys to come out with Krishna. And similarly, Baka, Aga, Baka, and Tutana. They're one family. Aga and Baka. Two brothers and Purana sister, right? Yes, ma'am. So they were, they were one family. This Baka Sura, what was it? Baka was in the form of a bird, bird marriage, crane, big crane. A crane, right, with a big beak, very big beak. At one point, even Baka Sura swallowed Krishna. Yeah. 
Yes, Maharaj. Then Krishna came out again, got out, then he broke the beak of the Bhakasura and Sakitasura. All about Sakitasura. As a cart, cart marriage. Cart, right. The Sakitasura. This was a demon who had taken and entered the spirit. Uh, spirit and his uh, ghostly body was uh, occupying this cart. Yeah. So, but Krishna kicked the cart, knocked the wheels off it. Knocked everything over. And this we got rid of the demon from the car. So, so many different demons, they all came. Krishna had pastimes with them. Krishna liberated them. Then Krishna picked up the Govardhan hill. So Prabhupada is making the point, Krishna didn't have to, it was no extra endeavor for Krishna. Krishna didn't have to train to lift up Govardhan Hill. He didn't have to build muscles. One time in the beginning, when devotees were first painting Krishna, one devotee made a painting of Krishna and they put big muscles on his arms. But Prabhupada said, no, no, Krishna doesn't have big muscles like this. Krishna doesn't need muscles. <laughs> they thought because Krishna is so strong, he's fighting everybody and killing demons and picking up the golden hill, he must have a very strong physical body. But Prabhupada said, no, no, Krishna's body is spiritual. He, do he doesn't need muscles to pick up the golden hill, right? Yes, Maharaj. So this is a difference. Uh, so... The pastimes of Lord Krishna with the gopis also, they're the most pure activities. We should not misunderstand them to be in any way mundane. That, and if one hears of them properly from the pure devotee, then shudam apapavidam, they're antiseptic and prophylactic. They're purifying and the uh, pure and uncontaminated. So hearing about them, it's not, it's not like somebody reads what are these pornographic literature, they have these pornographic literatures. You know, and well, most of the literature on the market today is all similar, on a similar level, you know, full of glossy adverts and so many things promoting the body and the opposite sex. But hearing about Krishna and the gopis is completely pure. And we hear about, uh, we, we can become purified by hearing about Krishna's pastimes with the gopis. Beyond this material world. So Lord Chaitanya, he spoke of the gopis as being the greatest devotees of Krishna. And liberated souls like Shukadeva Goswami and the four Kumaras, they were also attracted to hear the glories of the Lord. So we want to understand things in this way. Okay. So can we can we remove this from the screen? Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Okay, so I think it's time to stop, huh? Yes, Maharaj. All right, so we'll see you this evening. We'll continue. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Hari Bol, I think Maharaj left now. Hare Krishna. <laughs>